morning. Uh, welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. My name is Mark Thiessen. I'm a fellow here at AEI, and we're very pleased to welcome this morning Dr. Liam Fox. Um, Dr. Fox is a member of the British Parliament who has served there for 18 years. He was the uh, Shadow Health Secretary, Shadow Foreign Secretary, Shadow Defense Secretary, and then when David Cameron came into power, became the actual Defense Secretary uh, and served just, uh, with distinction in that role. He was a champion of a robust national defense and also a champion of the men and women of the American and British intelligence services who do so much to protect us from terror and from foreign dangers. And that is particularly what we're here to talk about today, one of the most damaging leaks in the history of American and British intelligence. Um, Dr. Fox had a fantastic piece in the Wall Street Journal yesterday in which he declared, uh, quote, Edward Snowden thinks of himself as a cyber age guerrilla warrior, but in reality he is a self-publicizing narcissist. He did not expose anything illegal. He did not attempt to limit any potential damage in making his point. Let us not imbue his cowardice with higher motives. Let us call treason by its name. Uh, those are powerful words. Uh, Dr. Fox is a friend of AEI, and we're very pleased to welcome you here this morning. Thank you. Nice to be back. So Dr. Fox, uh, Sir David Omand, uh, the former head of GCHQ, called the Snowden leaks the most catastrophic loss to British intelligence ever. Uh, what is your assessment of the damage that's been done by the Snowden leaks and, uh, and uh, to, to both our national security and yours? Well, I think it's huge, and I think you can see it on a number of different levels. Uh, first of all, we know that 58,000 pieces of very uh, confidential and secret um, parts of British information was leaked by Snowden. That is damaging to our security interests in themselves, and we can discuss that. I think it was also calculated to damage America's standing with its allies and damage the American diplomatic process, which I think is in line with what I described as the virulently anti-American and anti-Western views of both uh, Glenn Greenwald and of Snowden himself. This is Mr. Snowden, who uh, didn't want to live in a world, uh, he said, where everything was under surveillance and where everything he said and did was recorded, but is happy to live in an FSB safe house. Uh, cozying up to Mr. Putin's uh, closest friends. Mm -hmm. So the, this morning, uh, well, James Clapper, our Director of National Intelligence, said terrorists and other adversaries of this country are going to school on U.S. intelligence sources, methods, and trade craft, and the insights they're gaining are making our job much, much harder. You talk in the Wall Street Journal piece you wrote about how there are specific instances where we have seen chatter where the terrorists are changing their operating modes and talking about how to avoid certain things based on the Snowden documents to avoid surveillance. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, so we've, we've, we've seen from uh, our own intelligence how our groups in, in South Asia and some of the terrorist groups who we know pose a threat to us um, have been delighted to be told by Snowden how the security services went about intercepting the communications and armed with that information, they've made sure they're into um, less exploitable ways of talking to one another. And I think there are three elements um, to the whole Snowden disclosures. First of all, there was the extent of NSA surveillance. Now, I think if that was done within the law and within the limitations imposed, that's a legitimate debate in a democratic society. And I think that it would be hard to argue if, if he'd stuck within those parameters that that wasn't uh, a useful public function. But the second element to then go into what you've just described, which is the means and the mechanics by which the intelligence services go about their business, is extraordinarily irresponsible and damaging. And third, to go into details of the actual names of agents and operatives is criminally irresponsible and, in my view, a crime. Uh, and I think it shows a total disregard for the people who are actually involved on the sharp end, the, the decent patriotic people who will put their lives on the line for our countries to disclose their names in public. And we already know that that's done a lot of damage in terms of not only the threats to them, but our ability to deploy them freely overseas. So there are a whole range of areas. Uh, and, and clearly on that second, uh, if you tell the enemies of your country how you go about listening to their communications, the first thing they're going to do is to find a different way. And very interestingly, it's not just terrorist groups, and I think this is a point that's been very much missed in the American debate. This is also about the ability of economic enemies to steal our intellectual property and in the long term 
damage our national prosperity, but it's also things like dealing with pedophile rings and being able to break them up. So, you know, the next time when you get a, a bomb going off in a subway or at a marathon or when someone's child is abducted by a pedophile ring, maybe they'll want to thank those who made it easier for those people to do those things. One of the uh, secrets, you, put, you point out that not all of these secrets had to, that were leaked had to do with uh, surveillance and had civil liberties implications, which might have been a legitimate debate. Uh, but one particularly damaging leak was uh, the revelation that the NSA and GCHQ had broken the uh, communication system of the Russian presidency during, uh, during a summit in London, G20 summit in London. And it was reported by uh, the Washington Post that right before the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we didn't have any signals, intelligence, indicating that something was about to happen. Do you see a connection between those two things? And it have we, has Snowden damaged our ability to figure out what Russia is doing in Ukraine? Well, we have to be very careful about sure. exactly what's said and not said about these things. But let's put it in, in the general uh, terms. If, if you make it very clear that you have been able to get signals intelligence about particular ways in which communications take place, then it's very obvious that if that's compromised, then you have to close down a lot of those channels, and that will limit how much information you get in the future. So we shouldn't be surprised if we are less able to get an idea of what is going on in the, the world in terms of uh, the information we can get to understand or preempt uh, activities elsewhere if we've had to close down our SIGINT as a result of the compromises by Snowden. Why would anyone be surprised at that? Um, Mike Rogers, the House uh, Intelligence Committee chairman, has said that he believes that he said actually that no one in the intelligence community doubts that Edward Snowden is now under the influence of uh, Russian intelligence. And the only question is when uh, he became effectively an agent of Russian intelligence. Do you agree with him? Um, and what, what is your assessment? When do you think he he did. I think, that's, I think that's very hard to say, and uh, I think that I'm not going to speculate on that because I'm not sure that that's helpful. Mm -hmm. But what is very clear is to look at his motivations. And to say that, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, you don't want to live in a world of surveillance where what you say and what you do is scrutinized. And the first place you go is China. Um, and when you regard the Chinese embrace as insufficient for your tastes, do you head to Moscow uh, to be close to the FSB? And this is a Russia um, which not only invaded Georgia and which has just annexed the Ukraine in terms of its foreign policy, but, but let's look at it from a journalistic perspective. This is a place where journalists who criticize the president disappear, who have accidents in uh, elevators, uh, where the enemies of Putin have a terrible uh, chance of having premature accidents. Uh, where we've seen in the United Kingdom UK citizens, in the case of Litvinenko, murdered by the FSB. And this is where Snowden chooses to go. Rather than living in the United States, he chooses to make his nest with the FSB. Now, I think that either is uh, an, an indication of where his predilections lay in the past, and that's, again, a speculative matter. But what at least you can say is that it's very clear the choices he has made. And in my view, those are deeply perverse choices. So not all of the Snowden documents have been publicly released yet. We're getting this sort of drips and drabs coming through uh, from The Guardian and The Washington Post and other papers, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but uh, do you think that the Chinese, what is your assessment? Do you think that the Chinese and the Russians have basically know pretty much everything Snowden knew? Did, did, are the dam is the damage uh, done and that, and that counterintelligence uh, much deeper than we realize? Well, if Snowden was carrying these documents with him, if he was mulling them around um, to, the, to the Guardian in the United Kingdom um, and they were being transferred uh, further abroad, and let's, I mean, let's just talk about some of the security. When uh, Glenn Greenwald's partner, Miranda, was arrested in Heathrow, not only was he carrying uh, a memory stick with 58,000 UK secret files on it, in his pocket, he was carrying a piece of paper with one of the codes for the encrypted files. I mean, that was the level of the security um, and, and the ineptness by which they were doing this. So not only did I think they had uh, particularly ulterior motives, but it was more Mark Brothers than James Bond uh, in the way that they were 
uh, carrying it out, which would be comical were it not so tragic and dangerous. And I think we therefore have to assume that the places that he chose to visit, China, then Russia, must have access to all those particular documents, um, given that their own security was so poor. And we had one of the uh, incidents reported in the New York Times of Greenwald traveling to Hong Kong and the documentary maker uh, Poitra sitting 20 rows behind, walking up and down, discussing the contents of these secure documents so freely that they were disturbing passengers around them who asked them to keep their voices down. And this is some of, uh, these are some of the national secrets that we expect government and its uh, employees to protect for us. So uh, I think we have to assume um, that a great deal, if not all, of this information was completely compromised, and that has a lot of implications for the way in which we carry out uh, our security services, which are ultimately the protection of everybody in this room and in our respective countries. Glenn Greenwald was very upset about uh, his partner David Miranda being uh, assaulted, is in his view, in the, by, the, by the British uh, security services, uh, and he said that it was an attack on, uh, on free speech and the freedom of the press. Um, but he was carrying stolen documents. Uh, is there any difference between that and, say, a drug smuggler who stopped at Heathrow or a diamond smuggler that stopped at Heathrow or some other illegal activity, other than it's more serious? Well, it was the, the smugness, the arrogance um, of it. And, and, and I always think that this toxic combination of arrogance and incompetence um, has been one of the hallmarks uh, of all of this. And, of course, Greenwald... Um, said, you know, you arrested my partner, therefore I'm going to be much more aggressive in my reporting. I know lots of things about the, quote, English spy system that I'm going to reveal as a consequence. In other words, if you've got the audacity to stop my partner at Heathrow, I'm going to purposely damage your national security as a consequence. I mean, what sort of world do we live in where that gets a Pulitzer Prize for public service? The, uh, well, let's talk about that. Uh, so I'm a columnist for the Washington Post. Um, and my newspaper just was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for, as you say, public service. The Guardian uh, has, uh, has shared in that award. Uh, you've actually uh, requested that the Guardian be investigated uh, for, uh, for, uh, for its revelations and for harming national security. Can you talk a little bit about uh, uh, whether that award was deserved and why you asked uh, for the investigation of the Guardian? Well, whether it's uh, an award for good journalism um, as a politician, I'll, I'll declare an interest and not want to make a judgment um, <laughs> on that. Um, but a, an award for public service for possibly the greatest betrayal of our national secrets of all time strikes me as quite bizarre. And I do think that there's a real danger of a very cosy media world um, patting itself on the back without fully understanding the consequences for the dangers that we face in, in a very dangerous world. So I think there's a dangerous disconnect there. Um, as for the Guardian newspaper itself, well, my view was that if I, as an individual, gave the names of operatives outside a UK jurisdiction, that would be in breach of the 2000 Terrorism Act in the United Kingdom. Now, if that would apply to me as an individual, why would that not apply to a newspaper? And this is not about um, any privileged position of journalism. This is about equal application of the law. Mm. Laws are meant to apply to us all equally, not more favorably to some than others. And I think that that applies also um, to a newspaper. So I asked the Metropolitan Police, after having spoken to the Director of Public Prosecutions, um, to look at whether the Guardian had, in fact, broken uh, British, either of our main terrorist pieces of legislation or the Official Secrets Act, as a consequence of mulling 58,000 pieces of highly secret British intelligence around, or indeed, more specifically, of exporting outside the UK jurisdiction the names of British agents and operatives, and that's an ongoing investigation by the Metropolitan Police. So you haven't received an answer yet? No, and I don't expect them um, to do so quickly. I think it's a very serious charge to be made, and I think it's a very serious investigation that needs to be carried out, and I think it's, it's ongoing, and I think it needs to be allowed to take its due course, but I think it's very important that we do so. And I think there are questions here about the relationship between government, civil service, and media. And I don't think that you can take the view that we don't want the media to be able to portray themselves in any sense as victims of the state. The state's responsibility is primarily for the security of its citizens. 
So when I talk to uh, friends at the NSA, uh, they, they tell me that their British counterparts are absolutely flummoxed by the response uh, to, the, to the leaks here and, and to the NSA surveillance activities, that they really, the, the, uh, the British uh, surveillance activities have very broad public support compared to here in the United States. And so why is that? Why is it that uh, we, there seems to be such outrage in some quarters here in the United States over this activity where it seems to be very expected and, and supported uh, where you come from? It is quite perplexing, I think, from a, a UK's perspect, a conservative perspective, um, how this debate has been very different on the two sides of the Atlantic. In the UK, the public's view has sort of been, well, of course, our spies spy. And if they're not spying, why are we paying them? Um, and uh, that, I think, partly comes from um, our experience, historical experience and a, and a relatively more comfortable concept of what our security services do, and also our experience, probably particularly in relation to Northern Ireland, where mm -hmm. we saw a real threat on the UK mainland and relied a great deal on the security services to protect us. Um, but also, I think it's about comfort with oversight. And there is fairly uh, good understanding that we have a prime, minister, prime ministerial appointment of a cabinet an elected cabinet where the foreign secretary is, has direct oversight and control over GCHQ and SIS, and where the home secretary has control over the security service for internal security. And we have the two external commissioners, senior judges appointed by the prime minister. We've got the security committee in the House of Commons. So I think that there's confidence and understanding of that oversight. In the United States, the debate has been hugely focused on what the NSA does or is capable of doing in terms of civilian uh, interception, um, rather than the, element, the other two elements which I described of how the security services go about their business and, and the means by which they do so and the compromise of that and its consequences, um, and uh, also the impact it has on the, on the personnel involved. And I just find it a strange debate because what have we learned so far um, following the Snowden revelations? Um, has anyone shown that any of the surveillance activity has been illegal under the oversight that is actually set out in the United States uh, under a system uh, that's overseen by Congress where permissions are given by presidents of whatever political color and in the last two administrations of very different political color, and it seems to me that the argument has almost been hijacked by let's what we might call a, a libertarian element in, in the United States politics, where, where I think insufficient um, balance has been given in the debate to the real damage to national security. And watching it from a, the UK perspective, it seemed to me rather odd um, that uh, some of those that I would normally have expected to be uh, out there outraged mm -hmm. at the damage to the security of the American people uh, seem to have been focused on um, whether the NSA have the ability to intercept people's emails. Uh, just, I find that the, the balance in the debate something somehow just difficult to understand. Well, it's fascinating because, you, as you point out in your piece, uh, Glenn Greenwald, The Guardian, uh, the, uh, Laura Portis, and some of these people, they're virulently anti-American, virulently anti-Western, yet they seem to have tapped into a uh, opposition on the right uh, that's uh, here in the United States over these things. And uh, do you think the American conservatives have been duped a little bit uh, by, by this sort of left-wing cabal that is to, uh, basically trying to undermine American diplomacy and American intelligence? I think it's a matter of priorities. I mean, it's a legitimate debate, let's face it. In any democracy, um, the level of surveillance that security services are able to have um, and the level of oversight that they have, that's legitimate debate. I just find it odd that the debate here has been so skewed in one direction mm -hmm. without looking at um, what dangers are our children being placed under by pedophile rings knowing how we operate against them, by our entire industrial sector being potentially more open to industrial espionage, and the security of our citizens now being more exposed because the terrorist organizations and the transnational terrorist organizations against 
whom we've put so much effort uh, to combating in recent years, now know a lot more about how we go about disrupting their activities. Mm -hmm. um, when you, tell, you tell me, um, why has there been such an imbalance in, in the debate here? Well, it's interesting. The, uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the majority of the revelations have had nothing to do with, with civil liberties, which is fascinating. I think I one former CIA director I spoke with referred to this as espionage porn. That there's that there there are these uh, the, I mean if you look at the the Russian leak that we discussed uh, the ex his fact that his stone exposed that we had tapped into the servers at a Chinese university which was one of the backbones of the Chinese internet which mm -hmm. severely compromised our ability to collect on China um, even the the New York Times revealed uh, that the NSA had developed a capability using using certain technology to tap into Al Qaeda computers that were not hooked into the internet that they thought if they stayed off the grid that they were okay and we had found a way to tap in to find out what was going on in their computers when they weren't hooked in and the the, the Times reported that none of, the, none of this no, there's no evidence this technology had been used in the United States it was being used against Al Qaeda I mean does any of this have to do with civil liberties is there any legitimate reason why this should be in the public domain under any circumstances um, well here, this one I probably get thrown out of here, but um, I mean, just as I think there is a smug, self-congratulatory element inside the media that lives in a in a very limited bubble, um, I think the same applies to beltway politicians um, who are obsessed with the internal mechanics of politics and with, with, let's face it, abstract political issues which don't really affect the vast majority of the citizens, nor does it interest them. Um, what what does matter is the security of those citizens and their safety, and the safety of their children, and their ability to, to live without interference from foreign agents and powers who will do them harm. And I think that there is a, I think what this is perhaps indicating is a dangerous dislocation between the political and media classes and the rest of the people of the country, um, who would much rather listen to a debate about what matters to them and their safety and their family's safety than some abstract political issues, uh, which I think they think are hugely ephemeral. Could you talk a little bit about why signals intelligence is important, particularly in the war on terror? And if you think back, uh, and what in, our laws are actually much stricter, uh, I don't know if it's the same in Britain, when it comes to revealing signals intelligence versus other forms of intelligence. If you think back to World War II, if you had exposed a double agent who had infiltrated the Nazi high command, that person might be killed, you might lose a source of information, but it wouldn't put the war effort necessarily at risk. Whereas if we had lost the ultra program, if that had been exposed, the war would have changed in direction. So signals has always been seen as a, at a higher level, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, treated at a higher level. And now we've had our signals intelligence basically bared to the world um, with, with enormous damage. Why is that exposure so much more damaging than, say, even the exposure of the CIA's interrogation program or other things uh, that have been exposed in recent years? It, it's important because of the era in which we live and the environment in which our security services operate. I mean, the internet is a wonderful thing. It opens up information uh, to all of us in a way we've never had before. It opens up information in closed societies to the way they've never had before, which is a chance for us to export uh, our values um, to people who would never otherwise have been able to hear them. It's a tremendous opportunity in the era in which we live, but it also has a dark side, and the internet um, allows the enemies um, of our state to communicate with, with one another, a whole plethora of ways in which they can do that. It allows them to organize against us, uh, as, as we've seen in terrorist attacks before. It opens them up to uncensorable violence, which can teach them new ways of, of doing us harm. If our populations are moving into that environment, our security services need to be there too. Um, they need to be able to operate in, in that environment because our populations do. And it would be really nice if we all operated in one uh, information environment and our enemies operated in another. But that's not the case. Um, and so all the ways in which they transmit information and the ways in which we are able to intercept it are absolutely vital, probably more vital than ever before in the information age in terms of keeping us safe. That is completely blown apart. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, there are different estimates as to how much of our signals intelligence has been compromised by Snowden. But we have to operate on a precautionary principle. And if we think that any elements of our SIGINT have been compromised, then we'll have to close them down. 
Um, and that means that a great deal of the time and effort and the risk that individuals have put into getting this information for us is now lost to us. And why? Because you had one ultra-narcissistic individual uh, who was able, uh, able and assisted uh, by a number of others who have deeply anti-Western interests to completely compromise us. And the debate has not been about whether uh, the industrial enemies of the country now have access to our intellectual property, whether our children are more at risk from uh, uh, international uh, child sex uh, slavery, um, or whether we're more at risk from Al-Qaeda or other terrorist groups. But it's all been this beltway uh, discussion about what the NSA can do in terms of domestic interception of emails. I find this very difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. And we need to grasp that this is not a debate um, about, whether, um, about the freedom of the press. Mm -hmm. This is a debate about our national security. It's the most fundamental breach of our national security, probably of all time. And it seems that the penny has not dropped for many of those who should be the ones who are on behalf of the people of the country being outraged. So the other day in the press, there were satellite photos in the front page of the American papers of Russian troop movements outside Ukraine. And we don't have satellite images of the terrorists preparing to attack us. Um, so basically, in order to find out when the terrorists plan to attack us, we need them to tell us when they're going to attack. And basically, there are only three ways to do that. As, as, uh, there, there are called three eyes. There's interrogation, there's infiltration, and there's interception. So interrogation, we don't do anymore. Uh, we've stopped. Infiltration is very hard, as we saw when a double agent blew up a CIA base in, in Afghanistan. So we are left with essentially interception. And now that's been incredibly damaged. I mean, what is the risk that we face now with this damage of another attack happening? Much greater. I think it's impossible to quantify it, but we know it is much greater. We are, we are all, um, you and I, everyone in this room, um, and anyone who might follow our proceedings, are much more at risk, as are their families, because of the Snowden revelations. So when they're all congratulating um, Greenwald and, and The Guardian and The New York Times and uh, whoever else is lauded by the Pulitzer Committee, um, they might want to think about the real story here. And it does mean that we are all more susceptible to all the range of threats that, that I've already mentioned. And I just find it breathtakingly irresponsible. The, uh, the, Washington, the CNN just had a video last night of an al-Qaeda meeting, an open-air meeting uh, in, in Yemen, uh, where the, that, hundreds of these terrorists gathered with the number two leader of al-Qaeda, uh, speaking to them and rallying them, completely afraid of a drone strike, um, and in which he said, rally them to say that the, re the cause is to attack America again. I mean, it, how, how has the... Uh, how is the al-Qaeda threat, uh, you know, we, we kept hearing from the president that al-Qaeda is on the run, that it's been decimated, that they're nearing defeat. That doesn't seem like a, a terrorist movement on the edge of defeat, speaking openly like that. What, what do you, what, tell me what the al-Qaeda threat is today. Well, they will be looking to see um, whether um, we are able to disrupt them, or at least they will, we will want them to worry that we are able to disrupt them, mm -hmm. that we are able to hear them, that we are able to intercept them. And they'll also be looking to see what our political reaction has been to the Snowden revelations. So has the reaction in our free democracies been to say, this is outrageous, this is treason, this must be dealt with by the full weight of the law, or has it been a beltway discussion where the media is congratulating itself for being able to tell the public just what a big security risk that they've been exposed to. Um, and they will, I think, come to the conclusion that we are self-absorbed in a way that puts abstract political ideas ahead of the security of our country. And if we don't put the security of our country as our first priority, what message are we sending to the people who want to do us harm? And I think that we need to remember that this is not, um, as I say, some smug, self-congratulatory political bubble we live in. What we say 
is listened to by people outside, and it's listened to by enemies as well as friends. Um, and I think that we need to fully be cognizant um, of the encouragement that they will now have been given. Not only have we told them how we go about listening to them in particular and how we have gone about disrupting them in the past, we've actually given them the names of our agents and operatives, which puts those people much more at risk, much more, um, they and their families, much more at risk of direct activity or interception. Um, and we've told them that our political response is to gaze at our navels rather than to be concerned about public security. And I think all of those messages are exactly the wrong messages to send, and we should be ashamed of ourselves. But the gar editor of The Guardian says that he said, he testified before the British Home Affairs Committee, no names of intelligence officials have been leaked by The Guardian, he says. Mm -hmm. uh, which is rather bizarre from a man who says that they only had read 10% of the documents that they'd been given by Greenwald. So if, you, if you've only read 10%, and you're willing to testify to a committee of the House of Commons that absolutely no agents' names have been given. That seems to me to be an awful contradiction, but probably in line with, I think, that the, the whole intellectual case that has been made by, by The Guardian on this. And I also think both their irresponsibility in dealing with the uh, uh, issue and is a demonstration of their incompetence as to why the British government thought they, should, they were not to be trusted with the information that they had. Yeah, so Snowden and, uh, and Greenwald and everybody says that all of this is encrypted, it's unprotected files, uh, it's safe, safely hidden away, and as you say, only 10% of it has been published. I mean, uh, should we be worried that they're, uh, that they're not uh, correct? Whoa. <laughs> it is not a question whether they're encrypted or not. These are classified national documents, and you cannot export them outside your jurisdiction without it being treason. Mm -hmm. And if you even, even if you take their ridiculous argument at face value, Miranda the mule was carrying the password written on a piece of paper in his pocket about the encrypted files. Um, I mean, it's, it's incompetence added to arrogance, added to a perverse anti-Western political ideology. Th this is a very dangerous mix. Why are we not more outraged about this? I'm outraged. I hope you're outraged. I'm but outraged. we should all be outraged. Yeah. So if only 10% of this has been published, that means 90% is still to come, and it's out there waiting to be shared with journalists, shared with the world. I mean, is there any way to put this genie in the bottle? Is this, is, is, are these secrets de facto going to come out, whether we like it or not? Um, or, or is there any way to put a, put a, put a stop to these uh, revelations? Um, once it's outside our jurisdiction, and as the point that you made earlier, is very probably with the Chinese and the Russians. There's no reason why we should assume that it won't be. Um, we have to now accept that there has been a phenomenal uh, reduction in our ability to protect ourselves. There's been huge compromise over our, our security capabilities. We will have to invest in rebuilding them. Um, we'll have to look at exactly what proportion of our spending we contribute uh, to security. Uh, these, of course, these tremendous dragons um, that all these people rail against constitute 0.3% of total British government spending, or the equivalent of what we spend on the health service in Britain every six days, uh, or 0.7% of American total government spending. Um, I think that puts it in perspective, but we'll have to look again at how much we require to rebuild uh, those capabilities. Um, and we'll have to look again at, the, uh, at how we ensure that it doesn't happen in the future. We depend for our protection on the competence of government and the integrity of the individuals involved in the system not to divulge our secrets. And I think that um, we need to be looking again at the, the government system and the contractors it uses and the individuals. Um, to, make, to make sure we're minimizing the risks. You can never eliminate them, but minimizing the risks of such a security breach as Snowden happening again in the future. So a lot of these leaks have they had the effect of tying the hands of our intelligence service. For example, you know, we were able to read Al Qaeda computers that were not logged onto the internet. Now they know, so they're using other means. So they've, they've used countermeasures to go. So that ties our hands. And so the response in Congress and from the administration 
rather than to do as you say, which is to find ways around this and to, to rebuild, is to say, let's pass legislation to tie the hands of the intelligence services even more so we can show Americans we're doing something about the fact that we're not listening to their emails, to their phone calls, or not reading their uh, their emails, and so we're not going to have, we're not going to collect this metadata anymore, and we're not even going to require the phone companies to keep it, and we're going to make it harder for for the intelligence community. It seems like the response ought to be to a to a leak. Let's dramatically put a lot of resources into finding ways to protect our intelligence capabilities, as a, as opposed to the response to be, let's spend a lot of time tying our hands, the other hand of our intelligence service. Now that we've tied one hand of it back through the leaks, let's tie it legislatively with the other hand. Yeah, well, our, our biggest problem is that we've got a, a massive hole in our fence, and the first thing is to rebuild the hole mm -hmm. uh, in the fence and, and probably get a new fence uh, as the secondary part of that, and that, that's going to cost us money. It's going to cost a great deal of investment of time and effort. Um, but um, I'm not sure that we're focusing on the right things, as I said earlier. Um, if our citizens um, were investing more of their time and lives on the Internet, but not our enemies, then the argument might have greater legitimacy. But that is also where our enemies are. And where our enemies are is where our security services need to be. And rather than pandering to some uh, of the arguments that have been made in the defense of, of Snowden and his acolytes, I think that it's incumbent upon our leaders to tell people the sort of threats that we still face to be realistic about the fact that they, since 9-11, threats have not diminished. The threats have grown out there. Transnational terrorism is more powerful than it was before. And, and why we need to have the activities of the security services that we do, and to point out the oversight that we already have in place, that it's governed by law, and that no one has been able to show that the intelligence services have behaved illegally or disproportionately within the legislation and the oversight that they're already subjected to and the scrutiny they have from our democratic institutions. So let's try and get this thing the right way up. So everybody in this room, we're all decent law-abiding citizens. We hope. We hope, yes. So what? who is tracking our at movements on the internet more closely? The NSA and GCHQ or Google? Well, that, that's difficult to say, and um, I, mean, I, I noticed how in the debate um, people were going crazy about what uh, the NSA, or, and to a lesser extent but what GCHQ were doing, but they don't seem to bother when they go on to um, Expedia, and, it, and somehow magically it tells you the hotels in the last city you were looking at um, <laughs> or, on a different site, or when you go shopping that they're able to say, oh, we thought you would like this. People don't seem to regard that as an unwarranted intrusion, but when it comes to the security services giving protection to them, their families, and their country, they seem to be outraged by this. Uh, am I the only person that finds a very odd disconnect um, in this process? Um, and I think it's all about our sense of, of, of proportion and priorities. Um, we depend on the security services for our very liberty. And what I have found deeply perverse about the political debate is it's almost as though there is a charge against our security services that they are the ones who are a threat to liberty and democracy and freedom when they are the ones who are there to protect our liber liberty, democracy and freedom by ensuring that the enemies of all those things are kept in their box. And we need to get this debate in, in proportion. We need to get this debate the right way around because it's seriously damaging not only our internal uh, political priorities and distorting the internal political debate, but it is sending entirely the wrong signals about who we are, what our values are, and what our intent is to those who would do us harm. If there is another 9-11 or another uh, London, equivalent of the London subway bombings, uh, how is this debate going to look in retrospect? Well, that is that I think is a really serious question. And you could take uh, uh, a very politically uh, tempting route to say, well, um, thank you to the newspapers who've helped Mr. Snowden. Um, thank you to those who've given awards, to those who have helped betray our national secrets. But I think 
that we need to just stop there and say before we get into pointing the finger and the blame culture, how do we deal with the much more important questions, which are not the political ones, but the security ones? How do we repair the damage to the system that's already been done? How do we prevent such damage occurring in the future? And how do we reorientate our political debate so that it's about the things that matter to the people we represent and whose security we're supposed to protect rather than the cozy internal world of beltway politics and journalism. Um, time for us to get real. Well, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, we have one right here. We'll bring a microphone to you. Oh, so you have a choice of two. I'm, <clears throat> I'm uh, Jesper Steinmetz from TV2 Denmark. Thank you so much for appearing here today and for the valid points you made. Um, you talked about the hole in the fence. Um, as far as I remember, uh, Edward Snowden, before he fled, was like not a high-level employee. Uh, his highest level of education was a high school degree, and despite that, he had access to this top classified information. What does that tell you about the security of our intelligence service? Well, as I said earlier, I think that's a very legitimate question about um, our, the relationship between uh, government and the contractors that it uses um, to physically carry out some of the processes relating to national security and also the way in which they uh, uh, vet their, their particular employees. And you're right, this wasn't particularly detailed or specific um, uh, elements that were picked off the shelf by Snowden. This was more of a, a shoplifter running along the shelf, scooping off as much as he could. Um, however, uh, he did seem to know enough about it to ensure that what he did pick would do maximal damage to the United States' closest allies, uh, not just the United Kingdom, but countries like Norway and Sweden, uh, where the diplomatic relationship would be compromised as much as possible. So while um, he didn't appear to, from what we know so far, and as we say, there are tens of thousands of documents we haven't yet seen, um, w we know he meant to do damage uh, quite how specific he was able to be in the time given to him, we, we yet have to wait and find out. But that does raise questions uh, about how government goes about the practicalities uh, of its security relationship. Um, and, and these are legitimate questions. And these are the questions that we should be looking into and which for the oversight uh, elements in our respective countries should be the areas of focus. Uh, thanks, Dr. Fox. Dick Kaufman. I'm a retired CIA officer, um, and I served for about three decades, over three decades, overseas and here in senior positions. I would not have known a fraction of the uh, data that Snowden leaked that I've seen. I would not have known not only that it existed or how to get to it. And as I said, I've been in this business a long time. What's your view about, and I know you touched on it just now, but I wonder if you could be more precise about how it was that Snowden could have been directed to this. Um, it's inconceivable to me that uh, simply by surfing the net or uh, using his own personal resources, he could have figured out what, what was most damaging to our security services and the Western security services. Well, there will be questions to answer, and they are now beginning to be asked, I think, about his motivations, what may have been um, uh, his earlier, if any, links to any uh, anti-American uh, extranational uh, groupings. Uh, let's just call them that for the moment. Uh, and and that's, that's another very legitimate area that needs to be uh, investigated. I think the first thing, uh, before we look at motive, it is exactly the issue that you mentioned, which is how was this able to happen? How was he able to get access to all this information, given the level at which he operated? Um, and are the restrictions on those who are actually at the interface with our national security information sufficiently robust? Um, and I think, again, that's a proper area for the oversight elements 
within the constitutional arrangement in this country to be looking at. Uh, and I would hope that that is the issue of priority. Thank you, Dr. Fox and uh, Mark. My name is John Gizzi, Chief Political Correspondent for Newsmax. It seems as though we're having similar discussions like this year after year. In October of this year, it'll be the 59th anniversary that your Foreign Secretary said that Kim Philby was completely cleared and was not a uh, counterintelligence agent uh, just four years ago. We saw Mr. Vexnias in Greece release the names of 2,000 people who had secret accounts and were uh, hiding money to avoid taxes, the Medgard list. What can finally be done to actually have strict penalties on people who break the law and not make the kind of mistakes that allow a Snowden to slip through with this kind of information? Is there any answer to this? Well, th there, has to, there have to be answers because we cannot continue as we are with this level of ability, a relatively low level, employees making uh, such great uh, disclosures about information. So we have to look at areas um, in which, uh, of encryption in terms of, of the information and the levels of clearance that employees have in terms of their ability to access it, how we store data, uh, and uh, uh, whether there are simple firewalls in what we do, all, all of those issues. Uh, have to be looked at. We'll never stop espionage. There will always be elements in our states who want to damage us for whatever ideological reasons they have. Uh, we can't change attitudes. What we can change is capability. And what we can do is interrupt their ability to do us damage. That's the area that we need to be, I think, now thinking about in the information age. What is very clear is we've given insufficient regard to that in the past. Otherwise, this sort of level uh, of disclosure would not have been able to happen. So that is, that's an area um, that we need to be uh, considering. And I, I think that we need uh, in the selection of the employees to pay also due regard uh, and be perhaps a bit more robust in, uh, in questioning and assessing them. So there's no way of stopping it because um, the business of espionage will always be there, and let's face it, we're in the same business ourselves when it comes to protecting our own national interests. What we have to, uh, what we have to ensure is that we're better at it than those who want to do us damage. Questions? In the back here. Thank you. Uh, Leandra Bernstein, independent researcher and writer. I have a two-part question. First of all, you continue to refer to us and we, and wouldn't you agree that the United States intelligence establishment and the intelligence establishment of Great Britain are fundamentally different, in particular with regard to the history of the US intelligence establishment versus the much, much longer history of Great Britain's intelligence establishment? And secondly, uh, you also referred to the arrogance of the media. Well, the way that uh, there's an arrogance to the intelligence community as well, which is also rather insular. And the message that many Americans receive is uh, an impassioned, emotional, we are protecting you, how could you possibly criticize us? And that's, that's the message without much substance to it and with a lot of hypocrisy. For example, in, uh, in our response to the drug trade, our response to money laundering, and these, these other issues which the intelligence community, or chemical weapons, weapons of mass destruction, uh, issues which the intelligence community ought to be uh, taking greater responsibility for. Uh, well, first of all, it's the intelligence community, not the omnipotence community. So we can't expect them to be right about everything all the time. Uh, that would be utterly unreasonable. Um, th the second thing is, uh, I think that um, where, where, when you t what you describe as um, the arrogance of the intelligence community, that is the appropriate place for politicians 
to be talking about oversight, to be discussing the mechanisms of oversight that already exist inside a legislative framework in a free country like the United States. If they think there is insufficient oversight, then there is a legal redress. Um, and and that's, that is a good debate to have. That is a, a live debate that should perpetually be happening um, in, in free democracies. Uh, when it comes to the, what I describe as the arrogance of, of, of the media, I, I don't by any means mean the whole media, you know exactly who I'm referring to. Uh, in this partic particular element, there are huge elements, for example, of the British media who are completely outraged um, at the Snowden allegations and the way in which the Guardian newspaper in particular uh, was willing to set them out and are pretty angry also about the way in which the Guardian didn't face the full wrath of the law um, that they believe that individual citizens would have had they made the same level of disclosure. So uh, there's quite a big media d debate going on um, in that. When I say we, I do this instinctively because I believe that the free, um, and I mean this in the classical small L British liberal sense, uh, democratic peoples of the world, we, we are united by our values. And we are the ones who are at risk from those who hate our freedom, hate our democracy, hate our liberty. And we have to, at some point, grasp the fact that there are those out there who hate us, not because of what we do, but who we are. And it's who we are that we have in common and it's those values that we have in common and that shared history and contemporary existence that we need to protect. And I'm a huge fan of the United States because I believe that the United States, um, in the concept of American exceptionalism, doesn't pretend that Americans are exceptional. What it recognizes is that the American Constitution, the American institutions, allow ordinary people to become exceptional or to act exceptionally. And that is, that is a, that's the repository of the freedom that we enjoy in the Western world, which is why it's so important that the debate here should be focused in the appropriate direction. We cannot afford an introspective, an introspective and inward-looking America in a world where the external threats are proliferating, because the threats are not just to you, but to us, to we, together. And that, I think, is is why we've got to have solidarity when it comes to the security debate. If Miranda had been ca caught at Heathrow with 56,000 bags of cocaine, or if he had been caught with 56,000 blood diamonds, he would have been arrested. Especially, so especially if his plane ticket had been paid for by a national newspaper. There you go. And he was carrying the cocaine on behalf of the national newspaper to one of their former journalists in South America. Different questions might have been asked. It's a very good analogy. But why, would, why wasn't he arrested and should? Well, he was arrested, of course. He was arrested uh, under the um, Terrorism Act in the UK, but was quite rightly. And, and interestingly, what was the reaction of the press? Was it to say, isn't that great? Our security services have intercepted someone carrying 58,000 top secret files uh, that may totally blow apart UK security. No. The reaction, especially from the left of our media, was to say, this is an unwarranted intrusion into the freedom of the press. First of all, we were told Miranda was a journalist. Then we were told he wasn't a journalist. He was assisting Greenwald, who was a journalist. Then we were told he was the partner of a journalist who was doing some couriering, uh, couriering of information on behalf of the journalist because the editor of The Guardian told him that to regard uh, electronic communication as safe was inappropriate. I mean, we, we, we're entering into some sort of Alice in Wonderland political existence when we get into uh, this particular element of the debate. Here was someone carrying illegally uh, 58,000 files of British security information from one foreign country through Heathrow Airport to take it to another country to break, in my view, our terrorist legislation and give how we go about our security and the names of our operatives to who knows who outside our own jurisdiction. So should and he we're have supposed been to be embarrassed that we were angry about it. So should he have been released or should he have uh, been kept in uh, custody and prosecuted? 
it, it's n not for me to, to comment as a politician on how the law enforcement uh, procedure is, is continuing um, in the United case, in the United Kingdom. But I think I've made <laughs> my views <laughs> on the subject <laughs> relatively clear um, um, ab about what I think should happen. Um, and I think that there is a very serious national issue to be confronted here. And what if we come to the conclusion that it's okay? What if we come to the conclusion that in the name of journalism, it's perfectly permissible to operate in this way in the future? Where does this leave us? Where does this leave the ability of our security services to operate? And what will be the relationship between the state its citizens and the media in the future? This is a vital debate in, in which um, we are now engaged. And we need to get it right. And we need to give it, I, I would you know, venture to say, um, rather greater intellectual input um, than some of that we've seen up to this point. One last question. Um, it's been suggested that uh, Edward Snowden, by some high, fairly high-level people in government, that we should consider an amnesty deal for Snowden, whereas he would he would turn himself in, uh, receive some reduced sentence, hand back the documents. And w do you think that would be a good idea, or uh, or would it be uh, counterproductive? On the documents, um, and what are we going to do? Ask China and Russia to give them back, uh, and expect them to do so uh, without having copied them? I mean, get real. Um, the the damage has been done. This is a man who's betrayed the trust and confidence placed in him by his own government and by extension his own people. He has done goodness knows what damage to the security of his country and the allies of his country. He has been willing to be best buddies with some of the most dangerous enemies that the country has. He has made clear where his sympathies and values lie, and we want to give him an amnesty. Please. Let's take one more question from the audience. Uh, there you are. Hi. Thank you. Dana Milbank with Hi, the Washington Post. I didn't Post. see you there. Uh, so I just want to ask both of you to say whether you think uh, the Guardian and the Washington Post were wrong to publish the initial NSA revelation from Snowden. The, the press are perfectly at liberty to discuss the extent of surveillance. We have laws within which those who have the initial data can access that data. Um, and within the parameters of the law that we have, it's a good debate to have about the level of surveillance that we have. What is quite wrong and what is unforgivable, in my view, is, as I said earlier, to set out the means by which our security services go about their business, or even worse, the names of those whose lives are on the line to carry out that work on behalf of our respective countries. And when you get, as in the case of The Guardian, the unwillingness to hand back the information which the government says they have no right to possess, that they are wrong to hold on to and are incapable of protecting uh, sufficiently and into the bargain making themselves a target for any of those who would want to have that information and do us harm, who then have the information that they possess destroyed on the premises on the basis of a secure arrangement with the government, which they then break on the front page of their own newspaper only a few days later, and while they're doing so, are currying the same information um, to an external jurisdiction by a human mule, I mean, I really do worry about the ethics and integrity of that. And I have real problems being able in any way as a Democrat to defend that as, quote, freedom of the press. And I would just add to you that uh, I've already published a column in the Washington Post saying that the, uh, the Post should not have published those uh, those documents, and in fact, that publishing it was a violation of the law. Uh, I think the law on signals intelligence is very clear. It uses the word publish. So it's not just a matter of a person, uh, an individual, uh, the government exposing that, but the publication of it 
uh, is a violation of the law. Whether or not that would ever be prosecuted is another question, um, but certainly I think it was incredibly damaging uh, to, to do that. And I think finally it boils down to um, those of us in the political sphere. Are we willing to defend to our last breath the security of our people? Are we willing to defend our democratic institutions, the faith placed in us by our own people, including the oversight that we have a responsibility to have on our security services? And finally, are we willing to uphold the law at any cost and at any inconvenience to the political classes? That's the gauntlet that's been thrown down to us. The question is whether we've got the courage to take it up. I mean, I would just add to you, Dana, that you can, as, as, and I think as Dr. Fox pointed out, you can make an argument that some of the revelations have a valid, have sparked a valid debate on civil liberties. How does revealing the fact, this is not the Post, but the New York Times that did this, revealing the fact that we have figured out a way to break into Al-Qaeda's computers when they're not connected to the internet, which has no implications for civil liberties here in the United States, how does revealing that help national security? in any way or advance civil liberties. So many of these revelations have had nothing to do with civil liberties. Um, and so when you're talking about those kinds of revelations, there's absolutely no justification for publishing that in the major newspaper. And uh, with that, I see we're at 11 o'clock. So thank you, Dr. Fox, for a very interesting and intriguing discussion. Thanks, Mark.